Our world is an amazing and unique place. It brims with a vast array of life. Life that has even visited other worlds and learned to see its home in a new way. Today, our knowledge of planet Earth is growing, but so is our immense destructive power. Could the fires of a nuclear holocaust transform this haven in space into a cold and hostile world? And are today's images of famine and suffering a portrait of the future? There is a great deal at stake. It has taken four and a half billion years to create the world we live in today. The result is an entire planet where all life has become an intricately woven tapestry. But a tapestry that one species is beginning to unravel at an appalling rate. Funding for this program is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Corporate funding for planet Earth is provided by IBM. IBM is proud to support the innovative spirit of scientific inquiry that made this series possible. The rainforests of the Amazon jungle. No place better illustrates the interwoven nature of life. But these forests are under siege. Three thousand acres of rainforest will be cleared in the time spent watching this program. Cut down for their valuable hardwood and leveled to make room for cattle or crops. In one hundred years they may all be gone. And forty percent of all living species may vanish with them. The rainforests are among the Earth's most complex habitats where intense competition has ensured only the most ingenious creatures survive. The forests are so interconnected, they even create their own weather. A satellite image of South America's Amazon basin shows how rain clouds appear and disappear every day. They soak the forest, then the forest returns the moisture to the air to begin the cycle again. If the rainforests vanish, so will millions of species, many before we have even discovered them. Deep in the Amazon basin, Tom Lovejoy from the United States World Wildlife Fund, together with the Brazilian government, has undertaken an ambitious study. Lovejoy and his colleagues hope to learn how much of the forest must be saved to preserve the great variety of life within. Ecosystems are not static at all. They're indeed highly dynamic. And when they're affected by isolation and fragmentation, all kinds of changes are triggered within them. And that is why uh, we are here conducting a giant experiment to really study them as they change and understand what those changes mean uh, for design of reserves. It's, uh, in a sense, it's harnessing the forces of destruction to protect the greatest complexity of life on Earth. As the Amazon forest is cut down, experimental sections of different sizes are left intact. 
Over the next 20 years, each will be closely studied in what is perhaps the world's largest laboratory experiment. The project starts by identifying the forest's trees. A typical forest in North America contains perhaps 60 species of trees. This section of forest is alive with at least 600. Each year, deep in the jungle, samples are cut and catalogued by the thousands. Often researchers come across the leaves of a tree they have never seen before. A tree that could contain an unknown enzyme, toxins used to cure disease. Rainforests are great living pharmacies. Already they have produced drugs valuable in the battle against cancer. Here, strains of plants and insects that can improve farming await discovery in the rainforest, if they are not destroyed first. Ironically, rainforest soils are not rich soils. Leveling a rainforest to graze cattle will provide beef, but only for a few years. In five years or less, the soil erodes and the forest is gone for generations. Everywhere we are changing our world before we understand how it works. A dangerous experiment upon planet Earth. One that could ultimately destroy one more species, our own. August 6th, 1945, the island of Tidian in the Western Pacific. The crew of the Enola Gay prepares to depart for Hiroshima. Seventeen seconds after 8.15 in the morning, they drop the first atomic bomb. It explodes with a force of 20,000 tons of TNT. The fireball is more than three miles across. Near the center, people are vaporized. Eyes turned toward the blast instantly melt. Within nine seconds, 100,000 people are doomed. Three days later, the bomb is used again. This time, the target is Nagasaki. The light from the bomb creates permanent shadows burned into wood and etched into steel. Ghostly images of what once had been. Many did not survive for long. Purple spots appear on the skin. Hair falls out in handfuls. At first, doctors think these are symptoms of a mysterious infectious disease. But it is another effect of the bomb, radiation sickness. It is still claiming victims today. Now there are 50,000 nuclear weapons poised for war. And one effect of a nuclear exchange has been overlooked. The cumulative damage by thousands of exploding warheads to Earth's delicately balanced climate. Recently, scientists began to study this new and terrifying problem. One of them is Brian Toon. This is an incredibly unpleasant thing to consider. Uh, my, the group that I'm involved with found it to be uh, very difficult to do this work just because you had to think about what would happen if there were a nuclear war. People didn't want to think about it. They wanted to shut it out of their minds and not imagine that it would ever happen or could ever happen. But a rehearsal for the unthinkable has already been staged in the final months of World War II. 
bombing raids over cities like Tokyo and Dresden created great firestorms that raised huge plumes of smoke. Until recently, the importance of smoke had been ignored. But it is a key ingredient in understanding the after effects of a nuclear war. Smoke can stop sunlight from reaching the surface of Earth, shutting it off from the warmth of the sun. The effects of many bombs could forever change our world as we know it. Smoke is the key ingredient in understanding the after effects of the first nuclear war. After the blast, the shockwave smashes what remains. Chemical factories and refineries further feed the flames. Huge firestorms whip up great winds and send enormous clouds of smoke miles into the atmosphere. There are enough strategic nuclear weapons in the world to ignite every major city in the northern hemisphere and produce enough smoke to blanket most of the land. From high above the North Pole, the first nuclear exchange looks like an eerie display of fireworks. Its combined force is 400,000 times greater than the Hiroshima bomb. In the days and weeks that follow, clouds of soot enshroud the Earth. Temperatures plummet. The planet is gripped in a nuclear winter. As these smoke clouds move out uh, and prevent sunlight from reaching the surface, temperatures will rapidly begin to drop. We already know uh, from our everyday experience that at nighttime, when there's no sunlight, it gets cold. And uh, it would only take a few days for the loss of sunlight at the surface to drop temperatures in the continents to sub-freezing temperatures. The nuclear exchange has claimed several hundred million victims. Darkness descends at noon, and day becomes eerie twilight. Those who do survive face extreme cold. Crops and livestock are wiped out, and places that were warm just a few days before are covered in snow and ice. This first nuclear winter scenario, based on a simple computer model, has sparked enormous controversy and intense scientific scrutiny. At the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, scientists were compelled to take a closer look. How accurate was the nuclear winter scenario? Steve Schneider is a well-known climatologist. With a supercomputer, he creates among the most advanced models of global weather to further analyze nuclear winter. His colleague, Kurt Covey. What we're going to do in our model experiment is tell the model to assume that there is smoke between latitudes 30 degrees and 70 degrees. At the south and north poles, blue lines indicate sub-freezing temperatures. Red lines indicate temperatures above freezing. The computer simulates the effects of the assumed amount of smoke on Earth's climate. Okay, this is day number 10, 10 days after we've assumed the smoke to appear in the middle latitudes. We have blue lines in the middle of the continents. That means that the freezing has descended. Uh, in fact, you could look at, at Eurasia and see that uh, there's a number in there, 243, which is in degrees Kelvin. That tells you that the temperature has dropped more than 50 degrees Celsius. If you also look near the coastline, for example, look at the west coast of the US, you'll see that there are no blue lines. The warmth of the oceans has prevented the freezing in those coastal areas. So we had good news and bad news in the sense that it was colder in the middle than the single one-dimensional result and warmer in the coasts. But there is a new twist. In places, the cold comes sooner than expected. 
This is a case that gave us a bit of a surprise. This is only two days after we assumed that the smoke was injected into the atmosphere. Despite the short period of time that the smoke is there, there are already little patches of blue, patches of freezing that you can see on that graph that are starting to appear. And if that were in the spring or the summer, the growing season, it could have devastating effects on crops or other agricultural or even non-agricultural plants. There is still great uncertainty about nuclear winter. Nevertheless, it remains a possible consequence of nuclear war. Perhaps most disturbing is the possibility that within weeks, even nations not directly involved in the war could suffer sudden periods of cold and dark. They will face a new threat, famine. Images from the drought-ridden regions of Africa are all too familiar. Yet even the terrible famine here would be dwarfed in the wake of a nuclear war. Bombs could kill one half billion people outright. But for billions more, sudden climate change could wipe out crops worldwide and starvation would be the fate of the survivors. Famine is already a terrible problem, facing hundreds of millions of people on planet Earth. By the year 2050, there will be 10 billion of us straining every system on the planet. India alone has 12 million more mouths to feed each year. Yet, even here, there is hope. Until 20 years ago, agriculture in India had barely changed in a thousand years. With an explosive increase in population, widespread starvation seemed inevitable. Today, India has been transformed. The poor are still very poor, but for now there is enough food to go around. India has become a net exporter of grain, as production of wheat and rice has boomed. This remarkable turnaround began in places of scientific research. The International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. 25 years ago, scientists here set out to attack world hunger by breeding new, more productive strains of rice. In the process, the Institute's success became a symbol of the power of science to serve society. Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, the Institute's director, remembers how desperate the situation appeared when attempts to breed a better rice began. After World War II, uh, suddenly many developing countries which became newly independent witnessed a population explosion thanks to the advances in antibiotics and preventive medicine. And uh, the food production was stagnant, population growth was fast, and there was practically an atmosphere of uh, doom. And there were many learned books saying that many countries cannot feed themselves. My own being one, India, it was stated, can never feed itself and therefore should be written off. The heart of the Institute's operation is its enormous seed bank. Rice collected all over the globe is brought here and carefully stored. There are over 70,000 different varieties here, the largest collection of rice varieties on Earth. In this vast store are the genes for tomorrow's crops. Rices that will mature more quickly or grow on more marginal land. From the seeds housed here, part of the green revolution grew. Scientists realized that traditional rice plants were too slender and tall to support a heavy crop. In 1962, they dusted pollen from a Chinese dwarf rice plant onto the panicles of a tall, vigorous variety from Indonesia. Four years later, they released the first short, stiff-strawed progeny of that cross. A new quest to eradicate world hunger had begun. 
In the years that followed, new rices spread rapidly across Southeast Asia. Fields that once yielded a single ton of rice per hectare now yielded five. The work of the International Rice Research Institute approaches a global problem one step at a time. Other global problems require new tools. Today, the Earth is surrounded by a string of satellites flung aloft to study the planet below. They unveil a picture of oceans and climate, land and life, the interconnected fabric of planet Earth. At the Goddard Space Flight Center near Baltimore, Maryland, Jim Tucker enhances weather satellite images with computers. He assembles a series of global pictures that document the growth of plant life on Earth. Information central to understanding how planet Earth operates. With satellite data for the first time, we are able to look at the distribution of vegetation over the entire terrestrial surface and how this relates to phenomena such as the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, uh, the advancement or the contraction in the size of deserts, the extent of tropical forests, and also as it relates to the continued habitability of the planet. Like a special lens, Tucker's images reveal the status of plants and trees on Earth at any given time. Different colors represent varying degrees of photosynthetic activity. The purple of the Amazon rainforest shows the richness of the vegetation. The tan of the Sahara reflects a barren desert. Tucker has captured the Earth breathing. With each changing season, plants grow and recede. Here we have some data from the months, from the month of April of 1982. At this time in April, there is not that much green vegetation in North America. Areas in the southern portion of the U.S., as well as on the west coast, are actively growing. And in areas further north, there is no green vegetation present at this time of year. If we look in June, now our summer has come and the vegetation is actively growing in the eastern portion of North America, as we see by the red and purple colors. The summer has now come to areas of Canada and to Alaska. Although the project is only five years old, Tucker and his colleagues are beginning to make some revealing observations. A portrait of drought emerges. Uh, one of the areas we have been studying in more detail has been Western Africa and uh, the boundary between the Sahara Desert and the vegetated areas to the south. If the Sahara is on the move, the satellite and the computer will record its march and time will tell the tale. 1984 has been reported to have been one of the driest years on record this century across the entire Sahelian region. 1985, it is somewhat wetter than 1984. If we have satellite data such as these over a 10 or 15 year period, then we could start to answer the question, is the Sahara Desert expanding or is it contracting? And if so, by how much? We have developed new ways to see our planet at a fortunate time. Today we face the most pressing problems in human history. We are in a race with ourselves. Will we use our new knowledge to live in harmony with our planet, or will we destroy it? There are reasons for optimism. For science stands on the threshold of a revolution in the understanding of planet Earth. But the challenge belongs not only to science, it belongs to all of us. We live in an extraordinary age of exploration. We have viewed our world from space and from the depths of its oceans. We have unlocked secrets in the ice and in the rock found an ancient Earth that has changed many times. Exotic images have revealed the awesome power of the single star that fuels our planet.
And in our visits to strange new worlds, we have unraveled secrets of our own. Our knowledge grows at an ever-accelerating rate. In the last 30 years, we have learned more about planet Earth than in the past 3,000. Yet before us lies the challenge of a new era to truly comprehend the world in which we live. Our search is echoed in the words of T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Corporate funding for Planet Earth was provided by IBM. IBM is proud to support the spirit of scientific discovery that made this series possible.